Okay, lovely. It's so great to see so many people. Many of you are known to us at Sustain, have worked with the Sustainable Food Places Network before, but we also have great to see lots of new faces. Oh, somebody just said no sound. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, lovely. My name is Ruth Westcott and I coordinate Sustain's work on um, the climate and nature emergency and run the Food for the Planet campaign. Um, for those of you who don't know Sustain yet, we are the Alliance for Better Food and Farming. We're a national charity and we're an alliance organisation and our members are about 100 non-profits and public interest organisations. And our role is to advocate for a food system which is better for people, health, workers and the planet. So I run Food for the Planet, which is aiming to help and support local authorities in the UK to adopt more climate friendly, to sort of switch to policies and practices that will create a more planet friendly food system. It's really, really great to see you here. We're just two days from the first ever Food and Agriculture Day at the Conference of the Parties. It's the first time that COP has ever included an Agriculture Day. And I think it's fair to say that this is a culmination in a, a kind of growing recognition of the importance of food and climate change. Um, the latest IPCC report, which I'm sure you all read in detail, uh, which came out in June, said that it, it, it gave a particularly stark warning about methane emissions and how food emissions on the whole are on a trajectory in the wrong direction. Whilst other emissions are starting to come down, food is stubbornly increasing. And that sort of brings us on to why we're here today, which is to think about food and local authorities and local authorities role in creating a healthier and more sustainable food system. So just a reminder as the kind of Zoom equivalent of a health and safety briefing, um, please use the chat function to talk to each other and to introduce yourself and to talk and to ask and to generally chat about the content. We're really interested to hear your feedback. The Q&A is where you need to put questions because although we have Bella monitoring the chat, she will miss the questions. So please stick them in the Q&A. We've got time at the end for questions. So I really want to make sure that if you've got burning questions, they're picked up and the Q&A is the right place to do that. OK, I will move on because we've got a packed agenda today. I've got my two colleagues here, Sam and Bella, who both work with me on the Food for the Planet campaign. And then we've also introduced a number of um, some of the, the best and most inspiring councils that we found in this research to give you a little brief overview of where, where they've managed to make a really impressive difference on food emissions in their locale and they'll be sharing tips and advice and giving some kind of on the ground examples of great practice. So that's enough from me. The first speaker will be a rundown of the overall results of this massive piece of research that we've just been that we've just undertaken. So Sam Sam the data man. I will pass over to you. Is that my cue? Uh, <laughs> Thanks very much, Ruth. Thank you, uh, Bella, as well. Thanks so much for joining us today, uh, everyone. My name's Sam. Uh, I work in the Food for the Planet team with Ruth and Bella and help to pull the research uh, and analysis for this report together. Uh, in order to pull this report together, um, we extensively researched publicly available information from the climate, biodiversity and food plans of 179 councils uh, across the UK. This analysis excluded metropolitan councils, but we're planning follow up research to cover this group uh, in the future. We looked at four themes when we carried out our research, uh, which were governance, uh, farming and food growing, food waste and procurement. And we assessed policies across these themes for their quality. Uh, we're excited to share our results with you today, but firstly, I wanted to talk about some of our rationale for carrying out this work. Uh, so next slide, please, Bella. Thank you. Oh, yeah, great. Uh, so why did we do this? Firstly, the rate at which we are destroying nature and heating the climate is causing an extinction level event. And the food system makes up over a third of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions and is the main culprit of wildlife and nature destruction in the UK. So harnessing the food system is one of our best ways of averting this catastrophic 
act of self-harm. Secondly, there is a huge missed opportunity for councils to act on the cost of living and climate and biodiversity crises through the food system. Food touches on many issues and creating a more sustainable, localised and equitable food system will support sustainable farmers and producers, create good jobs, improve health outcomes, uh, boost nature and significantly, significantly contribute to council net zero commitments. Thirdly and finally, uh, we produced this report in response to interest from councils and food partnerships across the UK who wanted a framework for taking action uh, on food and a better understanding of how the food system is unfold work on the food system is unfolding across the UK. So in effect, we view this report and the website page that we're publishing alongside it as a tool for councils and food partnerships to begin, improve and signal action on the food system. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Bella. Um, so what did we find? Well, uh, six in 10 councils are taking no significant or meaningful action to reduce emissions from the food system which means that they scored uh, under a third of available points in our assessment. In other words, um, the majority of councils in the UK either have no plan or a very slim plan to tackle food issues in their area. We think this is partly happening uh, because many councils lack the guidance and support of a national policy framework for sustainable food and procurement. And from our interviews with councils, we also became aware um, that many are struggling with capacity issues uh, that are stifling uh, progress on their work on food um, due to the fact that councils have seen big reductions in funding from central government. Um, in our assessment, we also found that just 12% of councils had more developed and measurable plans in relation to their peers. Uh, these councils scored over 50% of available points and will have done well in at least one or two of the themes that we assess councils on. Uh, councils in this upper band were from across the political spectrum um, and many of them worked alongside a food partnership um, in order to carry out and implement uh, their food strategies. Um, so we also found that councils with sustainable food partnerships scored on average 11% uh, more than those without food partnerships, uh, showing the value of collaboration when working on food issues. And uh, in our interviews with better performing councils, collaborative working um, through food partnerships was frequently mentioned as key to developing and implementing an effective local food strategy. Uh, next slide, please, Bella. Thank you very much. Um, so we found a lot of variation in scoring across the thematic areas that we assess councils on. Uh, food, food waste was the area in which councils performed best, scoring around half of the available points. Um, this may be because there are clear targets and funding in place for local authorities to set up food waste collections, which is uh, not necessarily the case for the other thematic areas that we assessed. Um, we also found that councils scored worst on farming and fruit growing, uh, picking up just 19% of available points, which reflects a poor UK-wide policy framework for sustainable farming. Um, however, within the farming and food growing theme, uh, we saw a reasonable distribution of scores with many council scoring in the middle band or above, um, which is partly owing to the relatively high scoring of Scottish councils. Um, Given its vast potential for decarbonizing the food system across the UK, we identified uh, procurement as the big blind spot uh, in our analysis. Council scored just 21% of available points, which is more than in farming and food growing, uh, but the distribution of scores was significantly weighted towards those in the lowest possible band, uh, with 83% of councils having no or very little plans in place uh, for decarbonizing uh, food related procurement. The low scoring across food procurement uh, was contrasted with the fact that almost two thirds of the councils that we assessed have a stated ambition or policy in place to reduce emissions from procurement, while just one quarter of councils in our assessment want to procure and serve more climate friendly food for their schools and services. So there's a big disparity there. Um, next slide, please, Bella. 
Thank you. Uh, we also saw a lot of variation in scoring across the nations of the UK. Um, so Scottish councils are overall leading the pack, uh, but still only scored on average around 39% of available points. Um, other national and regional scores were pretty close together, uh, aside from Northern Ireland, um, but that's because they have an overly centralised decision making structure and there's a current absence of the executive, which is current, which is tying up policy making. Um, we found that there was a great deal of variation in performance across the regions of the UK when we looked at specific themes. Um, and effective national policy was identified as the differentiating factor in these cases. So the scoring in food waste and farming and food growing demonstrate this um, most clearly. Councils in Scotland scored uh, around a third higher in farming and food growing than councils in other, other areas. Um, this is because Scotland has a national policy requiring councils to develop a food growing strategy and as such we saw uh, high levels of councils in Scotland committing to expand uh, local growing opportunities in their areas. Similarly, uh, Welsh councils score close to two thirds of available points uh, on food waste. Um, this is because well, the Welsh Government has clear targets for food waste and has put up the funding to support these. So no surprise, really, that national policy is a crucial influencing factor in how councils performed. Uh, but we felt it was important to highlight the fact that a national policy framework for sustainable food trickles down to the local level um, because the Westminster government has so far failed to implement a strategy for making the food system compliant with our national objectives on climate mitigation and nature recovery. These findings really outline how vital national targets, funding and guidance are and strengthen calls for the government to implement a robust and science-led national food strategy. Uh, next slide, please, Bella. So on to recommendations. Um, so through the process of conducting this research, we identified 21 uh, better performing councils and invited 14 of these to take part in a short interview with us. Um, these are some of the most frequent recommendations that we picked up. Uh, firstly, establish uh, a, a food partnership in, in your local area. So almost every single council in our case studies is working collaboratively with people, uh, both within and outside the council on food issues. Many councils that we spoke with work with food partnerships that were formed uh, through the Sustainable Food Places Network, which is run by Sustain and its partners. Um, secondly, look for the co-benefits to drive the work. Lots of councils that we spoke to are approaching work on food uh, from different intersecting angles. So we com commonly saw work between the public health and climate team being tied together. Um, this is a good way of bringing together uh, disparate pots of funding from across the council, as well as a route for council teams to break out of um, silos they might be working in and work collaboratively together on uh, big issues. Um, so many of the councils we spoke to said that focusing on co-benefits created a stronger incentive for doing work on food as they felt they were hitting multiple issues at once. And thirdly, um, get funding and accountability in place. So almost all councils that we interviewed recommended seeking dedicated funding for work on food and using this money to hire a food officer uh, to create ownership and accountability for delivering this work. Almost every single council that we spoke to expressed that they wish they'd started the process of tackling food earlier uh, because of the challenges and opportunities associated with it. Uh, next slide, please, Bella. Thank you very much. Um, so what are our recommendations? These are the recommendations from Sustain. Um, we have a more comprehensive list of um, recommendations in our report and on our website webpage, which I'll uh, be sharing at the end of the webinar. Um, but we pulled together, we pulled out three to share with you today. Um, firstly, incorporate food plans into climate and nature strategies. Uh, this is basic, but it's a really good place to start. Council should be viewing action on food as an essential part of achieving their climate and nature targets. Secondly, sign up to the Every Mouthful Counts toolkit, which is run by the Food for the Planet campaign. Um, if you haven't done so already, signing up to our call 
toolkit is a good way to track your progress uh, in implementing our full list of recommendations and means that you'll be doing this work transparently. This will help us identify your progress when we carry out our next assessment. Um, thirdly, uh, develop a sustainable food procurement policy. Uh, procurement is a really effective tool for making food sustainable, improving health outcomes and investing in the local economy. Uh, a sustainable food procurement policy should include um, sourcing more veg and less and better meat from local farmers. Uh, we recognize that less meat is a difficult thing to sell, um, but some of the case studies in our report show that it can be done in an equitable and inclusive way. Um, and it's about building good relationships with local suppliers and bringing people with you uh, through communication and education. Uh, next and final slide, please, Bella. So what next? Um, well, sign up to the Every Mouthful Tank uh, Counts Toolkit. Um, if you haven't already set up a Sustainable Food Places Food Partnership, um, this is a really great way of boosting your work on food. Um, Sustain will soon be distributing small grants of up to £5,000 to support work in the areas that we covered today. Um, councils, food partnerships and groups are encouraged to apply. Um, if there are any councils that are reviewing their climate or nature plans on this call or are in the process of developing one and want some support, please reach out to us. Uh, we're very willing to help. Uh, and finally, you can reach out for a summary of your results or to talk about any of the above um, at my email, which is on the slide. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Um, and I'll be taking questions in the Q&A at the end, but I'll hand over to Ruth. Thank you. Oh, Sam, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you. There, were, there was one quick question, actually, that I think is probably just worth responding to now, which is what the colours represent on the map. Um, so I would really encourage you to to explore the website just after the um, call where you can see all the colors explained There's a key. You can, you can um, click in on your own council and look at the scores. Um, and the, essentially the darker the color, the higher the performance. So it's just, it's a scale. So the, the more, the more strong the color, the more points were awarded for that, um, for the, across the various different themes. Um, and then we've acknowledged those those top performing councils with a nice with a nice star. So um, I hope that answers the question. Anything to add on that one, Sam? No, that's fab. Thank you very much. Lovely. Great. Thanks very much. I can see the questions coming in. Please continue to add questions there. Bella is monitoring those. And if there's any questions that you particularly want an answer to, upvote them to make sure that they reach the top of the pile. Right. Thanks so much, Sam. That was an absolutely amazing overview and really um, well done on the data collection. It was not an easy task. Uh, and I know you're feeling like really ropey today. So we really appreciate you giving that overview. Thanks so much. OK, so the next se section of our webinar is to is to delve into some of the councils that have performed incredibly well and look at some inspirational case studies and examples of places that are really nailing this. And the first to bring you to is Middlesbrough Food Partnership. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Joe Dunn, who will talk you through some of the amazing stuff that they've been doing about growing a good food revolution in Middlesbrough. Over to you, Joe. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um... Thank you very much for having me and, and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here. And um, it, it's, a, it's a bit of an honour to, for Middlesbrough to be uh, recognised in this way. Um, so uh, I work for Middlesbrough Environment City, which is a registered charity. Um, we're closely affiliated to the council, uh, but we're not the council. And I chair and kind of coordinate the Middlesbrough Food Partnership and also the Food Power Alliance, which looks at tackling food poverty and food insecurity. On the right hand side, that's what our food partnership tries to do um, and is doing relatively well. Um, we've been established for over 10 years and we get significant support um, through Middlesbrough Environment City for a public health grant, which is uh, aiming to achieve a range of different public health um, aspects and food is a, is a key kind of one of those. And so that's how we kind of um, divert some of that, that money to support the food partnership. Public health and the, the Middlesbrough Council are key key um, and integral to our food partnership but it's also important that it our food partnership is seen as a third sector initiative there are pros and cons to that i won't go into those. but in terms of uh, just on cue someone's uh, doorbell goes and I, I wasn't expecting it 
So we've got public health, we've got councillors, procurement, economic development, waste and recycling, allotments, culture and events. The mayor is a part of our food partnership, environmental health, democratic services, planning, school food. So there's plenty of space and plenty of scope for, for many, many uh, uh, council departments to be a part of, of a food partnership. Next slide, please. So um, I was just trying to kind of give a bit of a flavor of the kind of like the place and value of our food partnership within Middlesbrough. Top right, this is our middle, uh, Middlesbrough Council's going um, green strategy. Uh, and it's based on the 10 principles of One Planet Living. And they identified the food partnership as the group to lead on food, which makes a lot of sense. And it means that the food partnership is moving more central to, to kind of working with other heads of service, that type of thing. Is our food action plan, the food partnership action plan, top left? Is it the kind of, well, it's kind of like the official, the unofficial, sorry, action plan for Middlesbrough. Um, and it's kind of, it's, it's fantastic to help frame things. Uh, the Food Power Alliance, as I mentioned, important subgroup of the food partnership. It's uh, identified as the Middlesbrough Financial Inclusion Group, um, group looking at food. Um, but then there's also the case of, uh, how much are we going to be consulted regarding a potential food poverty strategy um, and uh, 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 relating to that. So uh, next slide, please. So what I've done, is I've been asked to highlight a number of examples of where we've sort of Middlesbrough Council are creating climate and nature friendly food. So one of the first ones, and this is very much a council led initiative, uh, which is um, school uh, meal friendly uh, climate friendly options um, significant support from our food partnership from our food for the planet campaign officer and the council revised and improved the school food offer they saw fantastic opportunity to introduce more plant-based options as well as uh, improving the school food standards um, and it very much supports that uh, the, the Middlesbrough green strategy with carbon reduction and that type of thing um, so the, the food partnership through the food, uh, planet, uh, food for the Planet campaign provided expertise and advice and also drew upon the SFP network for expertise from people like ProVeg, which was absolutely invaluable. And as a result of all of this has helped develop and create a climate friendly awareness training module for the new public health e-learning platform, which is really quite, uh, and so it's embedding that going forward within multiple settings across the town. Next slide, please. So this is a, um, uh, a food partnership led piece of work, but working across the Northeast with um, the other regional food partnerships. Um, and we secured um, uh, 10,000 pounds from the Dixon Foundation to look at, engage anchor institutions and explore possibilities around a dynamic food procurement system which was highlighted in the national food strategy as a, as a key thing to kind of keep things drive things forward working very closely with dynamic procurement uk um, and this can sort of it can bring phenomenal amounts of benefits to anchor institutions if adopted money saving carbon targets it's 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 almost a no-brainer but it's quite a quite a hard thing to kind of to sell and, and implement um, and also can improve, you know, from the local food economy and, um, and, and things like that. Uh, the council procurement team, obviously, are a key part of this, as are all of the other local authorities in and around your area. So, so I would highly advocate for, for looking at a dynamic food procurement system. Next slide, please. So with the redistribution of uh, good quality surplus food, we've got um, uh, uh, an initiative. Well, there's a phenomenal amount of you know, 30 plus 35 or so eco shops and community pantries across the town, very much community led, providing vital food provision post COVID now in the cost of living crisis. Um, it very, promotes very much a, a reliance, uh, a resilience, uh, not reliance approach to, to kind of food provision in a very much uh, non-stigmatizing, promoting dignity, empowerment, first steps away from food aid, things like that. Um, and it ensures that food is consumed and not wasted. Within, within one year, 22 eco shops redirected the equivalent of 382, uh, saved 382 tons of carbon 
just through food uh, redistribution. So it's vitally important um, and it increases the availability of affordable good food, which <laughs> today is absolutely imperative, including fruit and veg in food swamps, food deserts. So there's phenomenal amount of additional benefit. Next slide, please. And then there's a whole thing around community growing and urban agriculture, which is, um, there's, there's a phenomenal amount of stuff uh, around this within the town. It's a great mix of council-led initiatives, community and third-led uh, uh, initiatives as well, and also linking up with national sort of schemes like the Urban Agriculture Consortium and things like that. Um, the council are making sites available for food growing and land and resources, which is, which is really, really invaluable. They hold that kind of key, but it's the communities that are driving these schemes forward with support of third sector organisations. We've got a really interesting, exciting progressive urban agriculture initiative called Farm Start in its infancy, coming to the end of its first year. And that's looking to really kind of kick on and develop um, local uh, urban agricultural sort of schemes and a network of, of people sharing skills, knowledge, resources. Um, next slide, please. So, trying to, to sort of understand some of the learning from all of this. Um, we all know that we need to tackle food issues, but I absolutely advocate for taking a holistic whole system approach with a food partnership. Food partnerships can really improve capacity within, uh, within the local area. They share knowledge, they improve across sector connections, and it's imperative that all food related council departments are involved. Um, we all know that food is cross-cutting, but for best results, you need to take that holistic joined up approach um, across all sectors and also within the local authority, both horizontally across departments, but also vertically, officers to chief exec, the mayor, and everyone in between. Do take the time, things do take time, and you need to take the time with this, but we really do believe that it yields results. Um, and embed what you're kind of doing, um, not what, uh, not just what you do, but how you do it within um, within key policies and strategies. So you can kind of embed, this is what we want to do, but how, explain how you're going to do it. Work with the, your, with the food partnership, for example, and embed that within the food strategy. And then that kind of embeds that approach uh, going forward uh, for the years to come afterwards. It makes it much more holistic. Um, uh, and also working in this way uh, creates opportunities to support campaigns for the local authority and important local authority work and ensuring that the right messages are kind of given out, not just by the council, but through the food partnership partners. Next slide, please. My top tips, um, have a food partnership central to important food related decisions. Uh, rather than tokenistically consulting them and uh, not, not inviting them to the table, let's use the food analogy. Uh, we feel that uh, absolutely food partnerships need to be central to all those kinds of important food related decisions because of the breadth of, of representation that they have. Um, have the relevant departments of the councils on board at the earliest stage. Um, because food is very expensive. It includes sort of having top level buy-in. Um, and then also working across the council teams um, and the food partnership is important that there's proper ownership of the outcomes of the work. Uh, someone needs to be accountable somewhere um, so for the work on food, for it to be properly handled and, uh, and kind of taken forward. And we feel that like something like the green strategy has been uh, in Middlesbrough has been very, very important sort of uh, to in, in this kind of process. Next slide. Just a very, very quick one. That's what a food partnership can do. Um, when you work together, you can achieve fantastic things. Middlesbrough achieved our bronze award uh, in 2017, the first location in the country to progress from a bronze to a silver, joined a very elite group. And we are now on our journey um, to gold, which we've titled 22 karat gold. Um, next slide, and I think that's me finished. There are my contact details. Please do get in contact um, uh, if you need to. Oh, lovely stuff, Joe. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, love.
great pictures. You take a good picture, Joe, with the certificate picture. Brilliant. Also, um, it, really interested in what you said about um, green strategies and particularly and like green infrastructure strategies is an area that we haven't really looked about too hard, much about integrating good food and farming and good planning um, and integrating food growing into those settings. So it's really good to see that you're working on that a bit. Really interesting. All right, thank you so much. I'm going to move on without further ado to our second, sorry, third speaker, who is Jill Murray from the Glasgow Food Partnership. So we'll head straight over to you. Take it away, Jill. Oh, you're muted, love. Yeah, it's there okay, it's okay. <laughs> I think I'd be used to that by now. Thanks very much. Um, it's, it's great to be here and really inspiring to hear what's been happening in Middlesbrough. Um, and I think it's really useful to be participating in this discussion where we can learn from each other about how we can all work towards more sustainable, healthy and fair food systems. Um, I'm Jill Murray and I'm here with two hats today. I'm a public health program manager with the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, which is part of the NHS. Um, and I've been working with Glasgow City Council on place-based health, including food, for many years. I'm also the current chair of our food partnership in Glasgow, which is what I'm going to speak about today. I'm very aware I've only got five minutes, so I'm going to spend the time focusing on how we developed our partnership in Glasgow and then offer a few tips that might be helpful for others. But if you want more detail about actually what, what uh, we're, we are doing in Glasgow, I've got some links at the end. So next slide, please. Um, our work in Glasgow is led by a cross-sector partnership called the Glasgow Food Policy Partnership. The group was first established following a seminar delivered by Kevin Morgan, who some of you may know. He delivered a motivating and inspiring session back in 2014 about the role of cities in addressing the problems inherent in the food system. Um, next. Next bit of this slide, please. You can see from his slide back from 2014 that the issues he presented back then are still relevant uh, to our food system now, and addressing these is more important than ever. Um, in the audience that day were colleagues from across the council, the public, private and third sectors who together agreed that the vision Kevin laid out for the role of our city in addressing the food system um, was really important and that we wanted to work together in Glasgow um, uh, to achieve um, a, a better food system. But despite the fantastic work going on across different bits of the city, we needed to do better to work together across the sectors and policy silos. So that really is how the Food Policy Partnership was born. Can you go back a bit, please? For those who don't know Glasgow, um, it's the biggest city in Scotland. It's got relatively high levels of socioeconomic deprivation and health issues, including inequalities in life expectancy. It's a place where improving population health and addressing inequalities is really important. And we have also recognised the climate and ecological crisis back in 2019 and have incorporated our concerns around climate justice, social justice and food into, into, into those plans. And um, next, uh, next slide, please. So our partnership was established in 2014 and in the early days we had quarterly meetings and networking events that were really about building relationships with stakeholders in those early days. And we wanted to learn more about what was actually happening, to understand where the gaps and issues were and to learn from those with expertise and knowledge gained from working to address food issues in Glasgow for many years. We wanted our partnership to work to add value and support to existing practice and practitioners, not to impose anything on them. We focused our work in those early days on understanding the food system in Glasgow, on community food and on food waste, because those seemed like the things that we were best placed uh, to work with on our partners. We offered advice and support for new policies in schools and with our partners, um, uh, and, and we um, supported the delivery of those. And we spent a lot of time building new relationships with stakeholders, encouraging more organisations to work collaboratively towards our shared vision of a healthier, fairer, more sustainable and more resilient food system. In 2016, we supported our third sector partners to develop uh, the community interest company um, uh, as a community food network, um, which, along with Glasgow City Council, has been a key partner in our work. In 2017, Glasgow City Council made the important commitment in their council plan to developing Glasgow to become a sustainable food city. And this paved the way for a lot of the joint working that followed. Um, but it was the Council's food inequality inquiry in 2018 that was particularly important because despite the, the huge number of responses they had for this, we had a really helpful conversation across different partners about what was needed. And it was agreed that a whole system approach was needed. Um, food inequality is a system failure and to tackle it properly, we needed to think about it in a much broader way than just focusing on developing a food inequality strategy. So that then led on to developing um, plans for a food summit, which we had in 2019. Uh, over 200 people came together in our city chambers. Can you go back a bit, please? 
um, over 200 people came together in our city chambers um, and we looked at what was already happening in the city. We looked at the great work that was happening in the city um, and, and how we could learn from that and build better joint working going forward. It was agreed to develop a city food plan which would look at the interconnected issues of food insecurity, community food, procurement and catering, food economy, community, uh, the environment and children and young people's issues. Importantly, the food plan would not be a council plan, it wouldn't be council owned, it would be a city plan reporting to our city's community planning partnership, where our key partners in the city all meet. Uh, we wanted this plan to be a true collaboration with shared ownership and responsibility. Um, two years of collaborative development took place, uh, working with over 80 stakeholders and engagement with communities across Glasgow. Um, the pandemic's arrival in the middle of this shifted our focus to emergency food provision for a while, but our learning from this helped inform the 10-year food plan that was finally launched in the summer of 2021. We're now nearly a year and a half into our food plan and things are going pretty well despite uh, the clearly challenging uh, contextual changes over the last year. Um, progress is pretty good and we've just published our first annual report which summarises our progress and we've made progress really in all of the key thematic areas and um, which is really positive. Um, I, I think I'm coming to the end of my five minutes so um, I'm not going to say too much more about what we've achieved but I can go into that if people want more detail. If you can go on the next slide please. I was asked to include our, my top tips for developing a partnership um, clearly, I've focused on, on, on how our partnership developed rather than what we've achieved here. Um, and I think the key, three key things that have been important for us were, uh, were firstly co-production, um, uh, doing with rather than doing to, I guess. So we've been really focused on working with people who live in and work with and within communities on food issues and have been doing so for years. There's been fantastic work happening in Glasgow. We just haven't been very good until the partnership is established at working together and really building synergy and collaboration into that. So uh, we feel that, our, that they are the experts in our job as a partnership is to work, work closely with them to support, facilitate and enable the changes that they know are needed. And um, the second thing is shared ownership, delivering accountability. Having a plan that isn't owned by one body or one organisation has challenges, but sharing the responsibility for delivery and recognising that each partner stands to benefit from the shared endeavour has been really, really valuable. And the last point is long term commitment and consistency and um, persistence, tenacity, stubbornness, whatever you want to call it. But we've been really lucky to have been able to work on this for a number of years. It takes time to build strong uh, relationships, particularly with new partners and with communities who might have been disillusioned in the past. This doesn't mean you can't make progress while you're while you're doing that, but it's important to take time to build that strong foundation. Having funds and support, for example, funds from Sustain and our Sustainable Food Places Coordinator has been really important in helping us build a strong foundation with our partners and helped us demonstrate our city's commitment to achieving the long term outcomes that are important um, as part of building a fairer and healthier and more sustainable food system. Next slide, please. So uh, that's all I wanted to say just now um, in my five minutes. Those are my details. And that's how you can get some more information about the partnership that we have in Glasgow. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jill. That was brilliant. Really inspiring, especially the way that Glasgow is focused on food poverty and climate change as both both as part of one and the same and not distinguishable and that's it was really inspiring to see thank you okay we're going to move on without further ado to mark hunter from east ayrshire council we are close to time so if i can encourage um brevity mark that would be much appreciated take it away thanks okay thank you um i'm mark hunter the strategic lead for food and facility support um, very much background of food and catering over my life in Span, but I've took on facilities over the last couple of months. Um, next slide, please. So basically, I, I cover um, all, all school meals um, and community food, um, along with facilities. East Ayrshire Council, um, since 2004, have been on this journey, and, and I suppose we've evolved with it over the years. Um, it was a, a forethinking um idea by Robin Gurley, for those who may know him in Scottish government, he moved to um, and, and since retired from there. Um, the idea was to look at how we could sustainably um, source local produce, but also um, better quality produce. Um, and that's when we started that journey in 2004. 
The, since then, we have the Gold Food for Life standard um, since 2008, and those standards are, are standards that we look up to um, and going forward and what we're doing. Uh, we're a mixture of rural and urban areas, so the logistics of East Ayrshire, for those who know it, um, is quite difficult. And we have around about 16,000 pupils um, attending our schools with 3,000 early year childhood places as well, which all um, within that we provide um, meals for. We have 40 primary schools and seven sec secondary schools, and we have at the moment 17 community food larders, which we um, support through a membership of First Year, but also um, delivering and training those volunteers within those units um, that um, obviously reduce surplus food and redistribute surplus food. And then we would pick up the likes of the First Year food in Glasgow and then distribute it out to those larders within that. Um, Key to this, though, those plans for that community larder side of things was all based on Brexit. Obviously, the pandemic hit, we were able to move fairly, fairly quickly. And then obviously now we're into the cost of living. So we are looking at that as well. We also do a lot of um, hospitality and community events. So that's our sort of remit of what we do now using our local suppliers that we put in place in 2004. Um, next slide, please. So the journey, right, the drivers were changed, social, um, educational and environment and supporting local suppliers and producers. Engaging with the community and economic development, food education programs, um, they're ongoing and they're developing all the time. Um, fresh local produce, freshly cooked food in schools. And we, we cook um, over 75% of our food that we produce um, under the Soil Association, the Food for Life, um, is producing our school meals. Um, building that sustainable model, we're always developing. We're on our third round of contracts. Um, over the years, and we've always developed what we're looking for, what our suppliers are able to, to deliver, and obviously the scope of what they deliver. Um, reducing food waste is important to all of us, um, and a lot of good work happens in all local authorities about trying to do this, and then utilizing surplus food, that's part of the, uh, the community side of things that we do, and within our schools. Um, supplier engagement has been totally um, instrumental in, in engaging um, all the time. We speak to them on a regular basis, and that came in line when we had the pandemic. We were able to speak to our local suppliers very quickly. We were able to adapt to the kind of items that we were wanting to deliver our food boxes within the community and our, and our school age children that got those. And then upskilling staff and training. We're supported by the, um, the Soil Association. We also deliver our own training, but we also develop those skills and key skills in cooking, um, which is very important. And we try and pass that on to um, the young people and um, parents and older people within the community through our food education programs. Next slide, please. So practicality, um, when we started off, um, and I would advise any um, local authority, if they are looking at this, is really start off with a pilot. So engage, engage early, see, see what the, see what the, the appetite is um, for wanting to do this, and then bring them in for um, information sessions or um, send out little toolkits to, that allows that information to be shared. We had to tailor the menus at the time um, and the recipe development to get the optimum result. So what we did was we had a three-week menu and to allow the suppliers to get around the logistics of East Ayrshire, we started week one in a different location uh, in different areas so they could get around that menu, especially when it comes to the likes of fish and the milk deliveries and the egg deliveries. We started the menus in different areas so they could get around that logistics. They have now developed that we don't have to do that now. So it's week one in every every um, kitchen that we um, we work from. Ensure staff and take stakeholders understand. That's that's quite straightforward. It's continuous um, collaboration, continuous um, discussions that you have with them over the years, and then promote um, East Ayrshire's food culture and community plan. So it's all part of that community plan that we have, that we work towards. Develop the food education and public information sessions. The food education we use and they, our local suppliers do help us um, deliver those programs. Um, they will come in and do programs themselves or they'll provide us with the produce, the produce that uh, we would use in that food education program. We also uh, develop and promote um, local events like the New Mills Festival. We would go and do demos, again, look, using local produce and obviously supporting our, our school meals. Tender and suitable geographical areas. So you look at what you, what's on your doorstep. We were quite lucky. We have a lot of suppliers down in East Ayrshire or Ayrshire as a whole. Um, and our Mark contracts- Mark, I encourage you to, um, to speed it along because we are- Oh, speed along going. even faster. Yeah, thanks. It's a real right. shame, but- Okay, so public contracts, we, we have a pan Ayrshire contract. Sorry, pan Ayrshire contract. So, um, and then we recognize an SME's um, disadvantage for the lack of tender and experience. So we, we support them as well in that. Um, next slide, please. 
Yeah, so we value the public offers access to good food, nutrition, and so we always do that. I'll move on to benefits. So we're reducing food miles by using the local suppliers. We're making use of supplier community benefits. Um, and with that collective in that, we invest in local business, the circular economy. Um, SMEs investing in their own staff and business and um, growing their, growing their uh, skills, developing what they do on climate, um, electric fleet, those kind of things. And then we value the food that we put on the plate as an investment. Uh, next slide, I think it's the last one, I think. So this is just a, a, an example, Moscow milk, electric fleet, um, reusing old plastic containers comes to our schools. The term of the contract, we were going to reduce 1.4 million small bottles of milk that we would normally supply in our primary schools by the kids helping themselves through these machines and then um, more scale recycling the, the containers. Next slide. Um, so just leave you with this. Um, however, certain food cost association, it is about an investment rather than a cost. Um, and that's how we look at it, um, that we do realise that it is an investment. We work towards the, the Good Food Nation Bill, which has now been turned into the Good Food Nation Act. Um, and that'll, that'll um, I suppose, lay the path of how we go forward um, on our food plans within local authorities. And also we're, we're driven and, and um, by the... Oh, I forgot that. Hold on two seconds. Healthy in schools um, under Scottish Government uh, nutritional guidance. That's what dictates what we do in our school meals. I think that's me. Thank you very much. Sorry. Um, oh, no, no. Sorry, rush. I'm sorry to rush you. I'm sorry By all means, um, email you. me if you need more information and then um, I shall get it over to you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, our final speaker is Nick Porter from the Local Government Association. So I'll hand straight over to you, Nick, if you'd like to unmute. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ruth. And I think my slides have been shared. I can't see them. Um, yes, we ha we have them on the screen. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, my bad. No worries. Um, yeah. So my name is Nick Porter. I'm the um, policy lead at the Local Government Association for Net Zero, um, Climate Change Adaptation, and Environment Policy more generally. And I'm also joined by my colleague Charlotte, who leads a lot of our work around the cost of living. Um, so yeah, I mean, firstly, thanks for inviting us. It's really good to be here and it's um, really good to read the report and actually hear from some um, quite inspiring stuff being done by councils in this space. And in the chat as well, actually, there's loads of great stuff which we've picked out. Um, so the LJ, so next slide, I hope moved on. The LJ is um, a representative body. We represent pretty much every council across England and Wales. Um, I suppose we have two functions primarily. One is around policy development, lobbying, the voice of councils um, with, with government and other partners. Um, and we also do a lot of work around improvements, so supporting the sector to kind of learn from itself. Councils are generally, as demonstrated in this uh, call, councils are very good at kind of exchanging views and practice and helping each other kind of um, learn and develop. And we play a big role in supporting that. Um, we're politically led as well, I should say. So cross party, politically led, um, currently a chairman's conservative, but everything we do and say is cleared by all of our political groups. Go there, next slide, please. Um, so uh, I thought well, we'd ask to talk a little bit about the offers we have. So I won't list go through all of these, but just to pick out a few things we do. Um, we have the kind of climate change hub on our online, which kind of brings together all of our support work and suggest you take a look at. Um, the Net Zero Innovation Programme is something that we kind of um, provide some funding for councils to partner with um, universities or other partners to um, try new things, to develop um, new approaches to helping support kind of decarbonisation. And I'm not sure the extent to which we've funded things around food before, so I really do recommend um, checking that out because we uh, there's a waiting to support those projects which are new um, things for us to support. Um, Senior leadership training, we do a lot with uh, leaders of councils, chief execs of councils around climate change, how to bring forward their climate change strategies. Um, and, you know, a lot of that focuses on housing, transport, and renewable energies and other things. Um, and so I think it's really useful to be here, actually hear more about the, the role of food uh, and what we can do more there in terms of supporting kind of the leaders within local government. Um, lots of lots of lots of actions learning sets where we bring together officers to um, kind of exchange practice a lot on retrofit. Lots of guides. I think based on the discussion and the report, I draw out our sustainable procurement guide where we provide advice to councils on um, how to procure sustainably, and a green finance guide um, supporting councils to think about kind of different financial options which are out there, grants and loans and other things to support their net zero activity. Um, 
And I think I'd probably also draw out the Knowledge Hub and Climate Action Group at being forums where we bring together officers and councils um, across uh, the climate change agenda. So again, the, the kind of range of issues we kind of uh, consider is very broad, but I think to have more kind of food uh, sustainability in there, is, it would be good and important. Uh, okay, just on the next slide, please. I can't see the slide, so I'm hoping it's, uh, I'm hoping you can see a, a picture of your fabulous report. Um, so yeah, so quick observations on the report. So uh, yeah, we really like it, we think it's really good. And um, it's it's really positive to see councils doing a lot in this space, um, reinforced by the presentations on the call. I think we'll draw out uh, a few headline opportunities, obviously the co-benefits around health, sustainability, um, food kind of poverty and wider poverty and um, climate change but also kind of environmental damage um, which some agricultural practices can um, leave on the environment and we do a lot of work around river quality um, for instance um, and of course councils have an interest in all of those different things and levers in all of those different spaces and so there's a real big opportunity for councils to kind of embed this in everything they do and I think that's been demonstrated by your um, some of your case studies in the report and on the, on, and on the call other opportunities, I just thought very quickly, market moves. So I think um, it's worth reflecting that actually the market's probably ahead of the state in some ways, like um, the growth in um, interest from people around eating more sustainably, more sustainable, sustainably, and some big chains seeking to cater for that, um, primarily because of profit motive, rather perhaps you could argue, but I think it's a positive thing and it's something to build on and link to that around public attitudes. More people are interested in, in this. Um, changing what they eat um, from various perspectives, including um, being a more sustainable one. So there's some really big opportunities to do more in this. And I think councils are a part of that journey within the wider kind of um, cultural societal change that is kind of increasingly reflective of food and its impact on the environment and health and other things. Um, so that's all great. And I think this report's a real, real big part of that kind of journey, that push. Um, challenges. Pressures on councils. Um, I wouldn't be working for the LGA if I didn't mention the absolutely insane um, financial pressures that councils are facing, not just reductions, which Sam pointed out, it's important, but also huge demands increases in certain um, services from social care, um, homelessness, other things, which are really put in council in a different, different spot. And so much for energy at the moment is, um, is around kind of working with government to try and sustain public services. And a lot of that hits prevention. So the case for prevention is harder to make when you have crises to fund and respond to. And um, so, you know, it's, uh, and, but councils around the country are tr trying to prioritize prevention, trying to prioritize things which make people's lives easier, reduce the uh, likelihood of crisis. And, um, and this is a part of that. Um, so I thought I'd highlight that. And uh, land use demands, I think it's really, this land use is so important, planning system, um, there's lots of demands on lands uh, for farming, renewable energy, housing, um, and I think the green infrastructure story around um, building sustainable communities of the future um, and thinking about adaptation to climate change. All these things are so important. They're all bound into how we use our land. And councils, I mean, it's a big challenge because there's a lot of competing demands, but councils are at absolute centre of that. And I think it's something that a lot of councils will start to think about more and more. And I put public attitudes as an opportunity, but I think it's also a challenge because I think Sam alluded to is some of these measures are quite political, they're quite jumpy, people get a bit jumpy about them, you know, telling people to eat less meat and all that kind of thing. And um, councils are politically and political, so that, you know, they have to, you know, you have to be check carefully sometimes about how you engage communities, which I think why food partnership models are so important. Um, but I think a lot of this comes down to information as well. As, uh, across this space, there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about um, what is and isn't sustainable. Some, it's about food miles, yeah, but it's also about the product um, and it's about how that product is grown or developed within a place. So, uh, you know, a tomato grown it, around the corner might not actually be very sustainable because it required an awful lot of energy. To, um, so, um, and I think um, it's a huge job to do around kind of raising kind of awareness in general, kind of community learning and genuine understanding about different foods, their nutritional value and what they do in terms of impact on the planet. So, um, so oh, just to summarize, I suppose, um, all really, really good. I think that we've got lots of things we think we can offer to councils who are 
to want to do more in a space but at the same time we really want to hear more from councils about what they're doing because actually we've learned an awful lot from being a part of this call and reading this report around the activity that's going on within local government which we want to kind of capture and grow within our own kind of wider climate change and environment work so uh so thank you my last slide Great. Cheers. Sorry if I overran, Ruth. No worries. Thank you, Nick. Brilliant. No, it was really great to hear what support the LGA are offering. And yeah, I'd encourage attendees to take them up on that offer, get in touch with the LGA, let them know what's going on, see what we can do more together to support this work. Right. We've got like four minutes for questions. So um, there's loads in the chat and we've answered some in text, but we've sort of left a few in there that would be good to answer live. So Bella, would you like to start with some questions, throw some at us? Hi everyone. Um, yes, so one that came in um, uh, nice and early from Joanna is um, given national policy is likely to remain a barrier in England for the next couple of years. What are the near term opportunities to support councils on healthy, sustainable procurement? Anyone keen to come in on that? Yeah, I'd be happy to if, if others don't want to step in. Um, yeah, so I think I think it's it's obviously tricky. Councils are under a lot of pressure at the moment, as um, Nick outlined. Um, but as Mark showed, it's best to frame procurement as an opportunity uh, to strengthen and grow the local economy and to see it as an investment rather than as a pure cost. I think from our side, the best thing to do is to set realistic targets um, to begin reaching out to local suppliers and see what they can provide to council run services in the local area. Um, and I think good to mention as well that we have already seen a few councils in England, particularly those in rural areas, begin uh, reaching out to their local suppliers, seeing what they can supply to school services, et cetera. And, and certainly we've seen some councils recently that have set targets to reduce the amount of meat they serve in schools. Um, so, for example, meat free Mondays is quite an easy way of starting uh, that journey into sustainable local food procurement. Uh, Ruth, I don't know if or if anyone, any of the other panelists had anything they wanted to. That's I mean, brilliant. The, Thanks, Sam. Yeah, do you want to go the, ahead, Joe? The dynamic food procurement system, um, it does require um, uh, noticeable sort of uh, investment up front. But as the pilot in Bath and North East Somerset has proven, it, it, it just it saves phenomenal amount of carbon. It creates much, uh, much more agile, shorter supply chains. It saves money. It does everything. It's, it's absolutely brilliant, but it does require sort of uh, a, a, quite a big shift in, in, uh, from existing practice to something else. But um, yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. So we're very, very keen to try and encourage local authorities to, to kind of move to that. But as I said, it does require some some upfront investment to kind of uh, to get things going. But, um, yeah. Uh, we're going to continue to answer questions for about three more minutes. But if anyone is leaving, bang on 11 o'clock. Thank you very much for coming. We will follow up with the slides and with a recording and with a copy of the report. Thank you very, very much. And thank you to the speakers. But let's just carry on, Bella, keep keep going. I think Mark had a point. Mark, did you raise, you wanted to raise your hand? Yeah, it was just on the, on the last question. It is really about starting off slow. A lot of us have been on this journey for a wee while and we've grown and evolved with it. There will be people that, and local authorities that are probably new to this journey. Um, and there is a drive, um, but it is that slow steps at first. Engagement um, is very important and continuous engagement over the years because um, we have now got to a point where some of our suppliers have got the electric fleets, they have got renewable energy in place, but that's took a bit of time. Um, and also their their own sort of agenda of what they want to do um, on their climate declarations. Amazing. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm going to try and boldly combine two of these questions. Um, so one from uh, Ruby, uh, which says uh, she's had people talking about councils having corporate strategies and trying to get food on that agenda. I wonder if anyone could come in about um, experiences um, of that and any recommendations. Um, and also as a as a slight segue, uh, Kelly Parsons has also put in um, about which council departments have been most relevant and interested. So I'm going to combine those two. If anyone wants to come in on either or both of that, those points, that would be fantastic. I would say on corporate on corporate strategies, 
we, we didn't analyze them and I think we should have a look. So thank you for the question. Um, it, it's, I think East Ayrshire's examples about how much investment, it was close to six pounds for every pound spent by the council in local economic gains and social and, and environmental benefits. And that is something which should be in corporate strategies because it develops it, its, its economic, um, you know, uh, led climate adaption and prevention, which is exactly what we need to be doing. So thank you for the question. I don't think we are doing it yet enough, but I, I think we should explore that. Nick, were you going to come in as well? Yeah, it was more of a general That's observation that local authorities we work with who really good uh, kind of driving forward the kind of sustainable agenda generally have it running like a green thread running through everything that it does. Um, and everyone kind of bought into it rather than it being kind of something that's seen as to the side of what local authority does. Um, and I suppose that means running it through your business plans, your corporate plans, and all the rest of it. Um, and everyone being forced to kind of think about the climate impact of what they do. Um, so that, I mean, and so I think even if you have like authorities who are particularly strong on certain areas like food partnerships, um, others might not be on that, but they might have all this other stuff they're doing. Um, so uh, I think a big point is around awareness and I think it links back to the procurement point as well as being actually a thing that local authorities can start off with that point around starting off small, you know, focusing on your own, you know, scope on emissions, you know, your own kind of impacts and through procurement and through your own fleet and everything is where is, is such a great place to start well thanks nick joe did you put your hand up as well yeah yeah i feel like i've, I've spoken rather too much today but i mean public health public health have been absolutely sort of fantastic and there's so much of the work that that um that the food partnership does it's you know everything seems to align very very closely with with all of that um and and it kind of does depend on on the person so to speak and so that's why advocating for, for kind of you know, getting it into policy so it's not reliant on the person it's the actual policy that drives the, the council um and things but i mean at the moment yeah procurement you know the our procurement lead is, is absolutely brilliant and then is really looking to to kind of drive things forward and to 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 kind of back up what nick was saying you know with our green strategy and that thread running through everything and bringing all all people to kind of together all the various different aspects relating to carbon together and food being a central part of that has worked really, really well in the last couple of years. So, um, yeah, from our experience, that's what we think. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question, Bella. Thank you. Um, I might, Jill, did you want to come in on that point? If that's all right, Ruth? It was just, it was just really, really quickly that I think it's it's worth, um, well, for us, it's what we find useful is identifying what the priorities are, for, are of the partners and linking food into that, because if they can see benefits of being involved, that's a really, really good place to start. So. For us, the climate emergency and food insecurity are really, really big priorities just now. And obviously, if we have a, a coordinated approach to, to improving our food system, we can we can help people hit both the climate priority um, a, a outcomes and and some of the, the challenges of food insecurity and the cost of living crisis. Thanks, Jill. Have we still got time for one more, Ruth? Okay, great. Um, so this is slightly more on the sort of demand side of procurement, I suppose. We've got a question about um, how we best communicate around less and better meat and overall dietary change. Um, I, I wonder if anyone's got any comments of their experiences of getting that across either at the sort of local authority level or even with communities. It'd be great to hear um, any advice or experience. Mark, did you put yeah, the there? in there? There's probably two elements that we are obviously covered uh, within our school meals under the, the Scottish nutritional standards, which is the healthy eating in schools. So part of that is about um, reducing red meat in particular. But on the other hand of that, working with our local suppliers, we do get on the other end. So you can get um, farmers contacting you. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing the meat free days? Those kind of things. But it's a bit of education. We have had communication sessions and information sessions about why we're doing these things within our school meals, but also um, the health benefits of what that involves of a balanced meal, never mind um, what it is. So often we see people overproducing, um, having waste, you know, we, we, we talk about these food education programs, don't overcook in the first place, make the balanced meal, and then hopefully that sort of sets the scene for where we go forward with it. And we try to deliver that in the school meals. 
Yeah, I think it's about it's about understanding that less gives the opportunity for the better, because on fixed and limited budgets in the public sector, you can you can use the ingredient spend to buy better free range eggs, organic milk, local locally produced meat for the meat that you do serve and then bulk out menus with um, pulses and grains and more veg. And that's how you meet your five a day. You get your health benefits and you can also support the economy. So that's the yeah the best way to emphasize those benefits. Thanks. Would anyone else like to come in on that one? Nick? I'll have a go, it's a difficult one. Um, I think the key thing and what came through in some of those presentations is um, the connection into the community. Because I think a lot of this will actually happen within the community itself. And some of this is happening, consumers and markets are driving some of this ahead of the state, ahead of governments, I think to an extent, or there's loads of stuff happening. So keeping projects really connected into those communities and making sure that they're responding to it and driving it and that they're kind of on this kind of improvement journey together. I hate that phrase journey, but um, I think that's probably the route through because um, it is it is quite sensitive with some people. So um, it's got to be really embedded in what localities want. And I think that's changing. So um, you can see you can see how it might evolve. Great, thank you. Would anyone else like to come in with one last thing before we I hand back over to Ruth? Um, just, just one point, and I think it's, it's important to focus on, and um, particularly for school meals, for the, the food being tasty and attractive, and actually, um, a, you know, moving from from a moving away from meat to highly processed non-meat products is not where we want to go either. Um, so it is, it is about thinking about how you can um, meet your your health outcomes and uh, as well as your cost outcomes whilst also um, incorporating your, your climate ambitions into that as well by redu reducing the amount of meat but making sure that the food is still tasty for the kids um, so I think it, you know it's, it's about all of that and, and, and it can be done it marks an example of how it can be done. That's a really brilliant point thank you so much Jill. Um, Ruth I'll hand back to you. I think that's a lovely point to end on thank you Jill great I want to say a huge thank you to all our speakers and panelists today. It's been great to have you. You know, Sam, obviously, and I have, have done a lot of trawling through and a lot of data collection. But what really brings this stuff to life is hearing the real on the ground examples. So thank you to you and congratulations to all of the the um, the councils that have done really, really well in the assessment. It was it was great to see such good policies and inspiring work in place even though we know what challenges are in place in councils. And I think it for us, it's just great to see what can be done and how, you know, that the mission for us now is to try to help other councils to get to that point and, um, and, and make sure that great food is the norm rather than the exception within local authority council action plans. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, I will follow this with a link to some of the great documents. I'll try and summarize some of the chat, which would be helpful to people who have been, haven't been able to make it today. Um, and send you a link, of course, to the new report. So thank you so much. And especially to you, Sam and Bella, for all your hard work on this. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to end the webinar in a sort of passive aggressive hit the end button now. So I'll say thank you once again and let you get on with the rest of the day. Very best to you all. Thank you. Bye.